Like most years, 2015 had its ups and downs and everything in between. Last January, D.C. inaugurated a new mayor with Muriel Bowser taking office. She is the second woman to become the city's mayor. While in neighboring Baltimore, the death of Freddie Gray profoundly affected not only this area, but highlighted once again the challenges facing police-civilian interactions in U.S. cities. With a new CEO, Metro left behind a year that included a fatal smoke incident, a stranded train, and other problems. And the district saw dramatically increasing numbers in its murder rate. But on a more positive note, Pope Francis, the 266th pontiff of the Roman Catholic Church, or the People's Pope, as he is sometimes referred to, visited the nation's capital. He met with President Obama at the White House and addressed a joint session of Congress. And the National Zoo welcomed a new giant panda club. The bear was named Bebe, which means precious treasure. Across the nation, growing fears and concerns were fueled by ISIS attacks carried out in San Bernardino, California and other parts of the world. In politics, Donald Trump took the lead in a crowded field of GOP contenders. Now he may very well become the Republican nominee. The gun debate was reignited after several mass shootings in the U.S., including one that killed nine members of an historic black church in South Carolina. Now that tragedy prompted the ban of the Confederate flag in that state. And NASA discovered that liquid water still occasionally flows on present-day Mars, a discovery picked up by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO. In 2015, Vocal Point covered topics as diverse and far-ranging as the legalization of marijuana to dating in the digital age to the power of black Twitter. We thought we'd take this opportunity as we leave one year behind us and settle into the new to show you excerpts from the best of Vocal Point 2015. We hope you'll enjoy them as much, if not more, than the first time you watch them. See you later in the show. Welcome to Vocal Point. On today's show, we're getting you in shape on the inside and out. Our experts are going to give us useful tips for our physical body and physical space as well. You'll see how the two go hand in hand. My guests are here and ready to offer great ideas on how to make that happen. Thanks to all of you for being here. Coach G, we're going to start with you. So I was at your studio and you showed me some great exercises mm -hmm. that should whip us into shape. Let's take a look. Coach G, show us some of the latest fitness moves. All right, so one of the latest and greatest fitness exercises and fitness uh, piece of equipment that's out there is a TRX band. So a lot of people have seen this, but a lot of people don't know how many different things you can do with it. Okay. When we're thinking about the TRX, one of the cool things about it is lightweight, it uses your body weight, and it doesn't take up a lot of space. You can do it in your home, you can do it in your office, you can do it at the gym, whatever. So. Um, one of my favorite ones here, we're gonna start all the way back. We're gonna work on our backs and those arms that everyone wants to, you know, everyone wants those Michelle Obama arms. Oh yeah, let's I'm go. I'm gonna show you how to get it. Okay, okay, let's do it. So we're here, we're gonna get our feet a little bit forward. We're gonna get on our heels, keeping our body in alignment, keep the shoulder in line with the hips, in line with the knees, in line with the ankles. We're gonna open up a little bit and pull our chest right up to our hands, okay? Coming back and up. And as you feel this, you feel like you're using a lot of your back muscles, using your arm, but you also are using a lot of your core muscles. So another one of my really, really like high intensity interval training type exercises that I like to work with are my back ropes. So this is great because it's gonna help tone your arms, which is great, work your back and shoulders, but also get your heart rate up. So you're gonna burn a lot of calories while you're doing this in a short amount of time. All right, so we're gonna do this, let's do 10 seconds straight, as hard as we can. All right, one at a time, ready? Set, go.
okay, you try to hurt me. <laughs> it was fun though, it was really fun. So what makes your personal training approach so unique? Yeah, uh, I think the thing that makes my training whole outlook a lot different than most trainers is I focus on the mental aspect. So many times we're focusing on what exercise to do, counting calories, figuring out what's the latest craze or exercise, when in actuality, if you're not getting your mind right, it's no way you're gonna get your body tight. Okay, let's talk about some of the, the latest technology gadgets. So everyone loves their phone, their smartphone, and there are so many things that you can do on that as well as your computer. There are a lot of apps that you can download for free often or sometimes for a low cost. One of my favorite apps is the Nike Training Club, and they also don't pay me, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I do swear by it. And what's nice, a lot of Nike stores in major cities across the country sometimes offer free classes. So if you want to take that fitness from your phone mm -hmm. straight into an actual studio and be with others, you can do that. They often have live DJs. It's an hour-long boot camp. But what's great about that particular app is that there are video instructions that will show you exactly how to do each move so that you never have to worry about hurting yourself and not having the proper alignment. There are also a lot of really great streaming sites. Mm -hmm. There's Booyah Fitness, Crunch Live. A lot of these sites kind of replace the, the DVDs and videos that a lot of people used to use. Scott, we're going to bring you in. How much exercise do we really need to get per day or physical activity per day? So a, a good general recommendation is about 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity daily. That's great, but everything counts. So if you can do that, that's wonderful. If you can be in the gym doing uh, strength training and all of that, that's of course wonderful. But even if you can't, any little bit of physical activity that you can add on is valuable. Scott, is it ever too late to get started? What about fitness for the elderly? never too late to get started. There's also a lot of studies on uh, fitness in, in aging populations, in elderly populations, uh, in, in populations that have disabilities. Uh, any type of movement within what you're able to do is going to be valuable. Danielle, what are some good um, exercises you can do sitting in the office? Well, one thing I try to do is check my posture. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it I realize. Oh. <laughs> <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> yeah, everybody's <laughs> <here. laughs> Just so that you're engaging your core, I mm -hmm. think a lot of great exercises are based on how strong your core is, and making sure that you're constantly engaged in that makes it easier if you're trying a Pilates class or if you're trying yoga or some of the other things. There are a few foundational exercises that I love. I don't necessarily know if you could do them at your desk, mm. but um, squats are a fantastic exercise mm -hmm. for, for everyone push-ups. I say the mm -hmm. core is the foundation of your house, mm -hmm. so I just kind of start there because every motion that we do in life starts from the core. Okay. Scott? You know, don't forget about walking. Mm -hmm. So I think these are great exercises, but one of the things that I try to do during busy days when I don't have time to go to the gym and I don't have time to exercise is just try to sneak even a five minute walk in during my day, walk around the block, come back. I feel better in my head and it's also good for my body. Congrats to you. You recently lost 100 pounds. So you've got to tell us how you did that. I, oh my goodness, I starved myself. <laughs> no. <laughs> don't let the doctor hear you. No, 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 no. Um, you know what? This this is, this is my second time around in weight loss. Before I lost 61 pounds in three months in 2013 spinning. Wow. Um, and I've, I've lost 100 pounds, basically a combination of spin, um, trail biking, working out with this uh, guy over here because he's my <laughs> partner in crime, Coach G, <laughs> coming into uh, Sweat Fitness, going to his spin class, but also changing my entire diet. It was an ultimatum that my, my gastroenterologist gave me and, and death wasn't an option for me. So I had to wake up one morning and say, it's time to live and it's time to lose this weight. When you were at your highest weight, did you get depressed? And, and what did you do? Did you, because I know you're an interior designer, mm -hmm. So what other things did you need to do in order to motivate you? You know what, I my, my home looked like my physical. Mm. So I was this very large man, and my home <laughs> was not, wasn't that large, but it was filled with stuff mm -hmm. because I was depressed, I was stressed. I found that taking out all of the clutter and organizing my home um, attributed to my wellness and my health. Um, I would say, to tell anyone who's going you know, through a weight loss uh, journey right now that you know, Gerard and I say this all the time, if your interior doesn't look well, your exterior won't look well. And so I would say focus on your interior and your exterior at the same time in order to give yourself the, the, the best physical benefit of having a healthy lifestyle, but also having a healthy living environment. 
Are you all ready to ride? Let's go. Let's go. All right, let's do it. Let's push that gear to a 10 for me. RPMs. Let's go to 110. Come on. We're going to start with push-ups and our elbows down for eight. Down and up. Down, up. Good job. In recent years, cancer's mortality rates for all Americans have improved, but for certain minority and ethnic groups in the U.S., the progress is anything but balanced. Although breast cancer is discovered more frequently in white women, black women are more likely to die from the disease. The highest rates of prostate cancer and related deaths are found in black men, with the lowest cases in Asians and Pacific Islanders. American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest death rates for kidney cancer. Asians and Pacific Islanders suffer the highest percentage for both liver and stomach cancer and are twice as likely to die from these as whites. Hispanic Latino women have the highest rates of cervical cancer, although black women have higher death rates from the disease. And for all cancers combined, the death rate in the U.S. for blacks is 25% higher than for whites. Dr. Wilson, you are not only a cancer surgeon, but you're also a cancer survivor. I am. I'm a two-year breast cancer survivor. I was originally diagnosed in June of 2013. After having my son, I breastfed, did all, you know, doing the right things, um, all the things that we're told to do. And when I stopped breastfeeding, I noticed that one of my breasts didn't go back to the size as I expected. I went for my screening, my diagnostic, my biopsy and found out that I had breast cancer on that side. But during that entire phase, what I found was that it wasn't just on one side, it was actually on both sides and it was two different types of breast cancer. And I was treated with radiation, well, with chemotherapy first, surgery second, and radiation third. Are you considered cancer free now? I am cancer free right now. Congratulations. Thank That's great you. to hear. Let's talk to you, Robert. Speaking of prostate cancer, yes. you were diagnosed in 2010, and how did that impact your life? In 2010, at age 48, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and, uh, and I'm quite sure uh, other folks out there who have been diagnosed with the disease, once you hear that word, you know, it all goes downhill mm -hmm. momentarily. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, quite frankly, I thought about who was going to bury me, oh. what route the limousine was going to oh, go. I mean, no. it's just devastating. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, quickly, you know, though, I'm, I've always been a fighter. And I gathered myself together and said, okay, look here, I'm going to give this a fight and I'm going to make it work and we're going to get better. And so getting all the information about prostate cancer, um, I was able to make an informed decision and, and actually see doctors who really knew what they were doing um, to get me through it. But I, I will say this though, uh, it's important that our families pass on this information about cancers. Mm -hmm. My father actually had asked my mom to not tell the kids that he had cancer because he didn't want us worrying. And while I understand that, uh, but that would have been good information for me to know. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to move beyond that point where, you know, we have to move beyond the fear. If you have it, let your family members know. And uh, I think that's important for us as a community content to uh, continue to get well. Well, cancer has affected me personally because I just recently had two family members that died from breast cancer. So you can just imagine, um, it not only affected me personally, but my entire family as a whole. My sister-in-law is a two-year uh, recovery from breast cancer. Um, my uncle is also in remission from colon cancer. My husband and I, we have lost loved ones to pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, and colon cancer. My aunts and uncles, um, especially uh, prostate cancer, as my uh, uncles are getting older. When I first started school, um, a facilitator who was really close to me passed away of cancer. A um, couple of months ago, my aunt passed away of cancer. It seems um, a lot of people I know are either taking proton therapy or surgery or what have you for um, prostate cancer. And as a, as a man, I find that um, 
and aging, you know, I, I, I look at that carefully. There is an abundance of information available. However, it's typically as an African-American family, we find ourselves not realizing or believing that cancer can impact us directly. Us as African-Americans, something will be wrong with us and we'll never even go check it out. So it's kind of almost too late when we do find out what's going on. I would just say go to the doctor um, more of a regular basis and just try to talk to more people about it. Skin cancer by far is the most common of all cancers, and one form of the disease, melanoma, affects 20 times more Caucasians than those of African descent. But that doesn't mean that those of us with darker skin tones aren't at risk. There's a myth that an abundance of melanin keeps you from the disease, and that's wrong. That myth is why people are getting misdiagnosed, and that can be deadly. In fact, there is an aggressive type of skin cancer that affects darker skinned people, and it's the same cancer that caused the death of famous reggae icon Bob Marley. And here to tell us more about this is Dr. Moral Skelzi, who is a skin cancer specialist. Also with us is Erica Thomas, one of her patients. Thanks to both of you for being here. Dr. Skelzi, let's talk about the Bob Marley phenomenon. What is it? That's a very sad and not an uncommon phenomenon of a person of color being misdiagnosed with melanoma and diagnosed very late. Unfortunately, Bob Marley had what he thought was a soccer injury on his toe when in fact he had a melanoma and he had the kind of melanoma, acral lentiginous melanoma, which is most common in skin of color. This melanoma was misdiagnosed and treated as a soccer injury for a long time and then he eventually died of that melanoma. Okay, so your patient Erica is here to talk about her experience and what happened with you and being misdiagnosed? Well, growing up, I spent a lot of time outdoors. I never thought about sunscreen or anything unless, you know, my mom said so. And um, I went to a dermatologist for an issue and kind of like a by the way, I was like, oh, I have this mole. And um, what do you think about it? And he basically told me that I was too brown to have to worry about skin cancer. So I went on my way and um, ended up going to Dr. Skelsey's office about the mole, got a biopsy done shock of my life. Mm. This myth is very pervasive that skin of color is immune to skin cancer when in fact it's not. Both men and women of color are at risk for skin cancer and unfortunately because of that late diagnosis they're often discovered at a very late stage and skin cancer while not as common in skin of color as it is in the Caucasian population is more often diagnosed at a late stage and more often fatal. Rarely do we meet a person who hasn't been touched by it in some way. A friend, a relative, a co-worker. Everyone knows somebody that knows somebody. And despite the fact that it's not necessarily an immediate death sentence anymore, it still makes most of us a little nervous when we think about it. No matter who we are, no matter the color. A recent 2014 Pew survey shows support growing for legal marijuana. 52% of Americans thought it should be legal, while 45% said no. Recently, Washington, D.C. joined a growing list of states to enact laws legalizing marijuana for not only medical reasons, but for recreational use as well. The passage of Initiative 71 allowed adults in the district 21 years and older to possess up to two ounces of marijuana for personal use and grow up to six cannabis plants in their homes. It also made legal the transfer of one ounce of marijuana one person to another as long as it's not being sold. In neighboring Maryland, existing statutes decriminalize the possession of 10 grams or less. Medical marijuana in that state, however, is authorized. And south of the district in Virginia, the the sale, transport, possession, and cultivation of any cannabis, medical or otherwise, is illegal. 
Some anti-drug advocates fear we'll look back on the early days of marijuana legalization and say that was when it all went to pot. Others feel the situation to be already dire as more people, especially the young, are caught in the crossfire of the war on drugs. Alan, I'm going to start with you, and this is from a July editorial in the New York Times. It says, the federal law that makes possession of marijuana a crime has its origin in legislation that was passed in an atmosphere of hysteria during the 1930s and that was firmly rooted in prejudices against Mexican immigrants and African Americans. Talk about that a little bit and why are we seeing some of that, as you believe, today? <clears throat> the 1937 congressional testimony that was given could not be said today in polite society. It's so bizarre, racist, and non-scientific. Uh, field Negroids um, developing superhuman strength under the drug um, are some of the ideas that are put forward. So uh, it's not based in science whatsoever. So then something happened in the 60s, so we're moving up about 30 years, and what happened? Apparently more white college students were using the drugs, and then, and then what happened? Um, from about 1937 to the 1960s, there really weren't that many arrests, and if they were, they happened mainly to celebrities who got busted every so often and to poor minorities. But it wasn't until um, people coming back from Vietnam got busted using marijuana and a white middle class going to college using it that you then start to have a discussion around, should we legalize marijuana? But there's still all of these arrests. So can you give us some statistics? What are the actual hard numbers that show more African Americans, more people of color getting arrested? Yes, I think that you're, you're exactly right. There's a profound racial disparity in the way marijuana laws are enforced across the country, and particularly here in the District of Columbia. 16th Street runs like a line across the city, and to the east of 16th Street, where you have more than 90% of the African American population, you have the overwhelming majority of arrests. And in fact, black people in the district, while only making up 50% of the population, make up 91% of the arrests. So that is a virtual selective enforcement. And what's so staggering about that is the, the stats and data we know about how people consume and use marijuana between racial groups. Black and white people actually use marijuana at approximately the same rates. Mm -hmm. And yet black people are subjected to nearly um, singular enforcement of, of this of this law. Now, it's particularly interesting here in D.C. because west of 16th Street you have some of the highest rates of marijuana consumption of anywhere in the country. So, William, let's bring you into the discussion. Yes. Even hearing the statistics, you're still opposed to legalizing marijuana in the district. Why so? The reality is the U.N. Uh, question why the U.S. was taking the legalization route. Most countries around the world have laws against marijuana use. Um, even uh, predominantly black countries uh, have laws against marijuana use. Nelson Mandela uh, was very much uh, against uh, the legalization of drugs, and so and he said it poses a serious threat to our country. So when in the face of that, yes, America has had a, and is still in many ways dealing with uh, chronic racial issues, uh, but at its heart, um, Marijuana is, it, it's been enforced disproportionately. That's not, that's not up for argument. That needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But at its heart, it's a health issue. What's going to be good for the health of the nation? What's going to be good for the health of our youth? We have an insider, as I like to call him. So Matthew, jump in here and talk about some things that you saw when you were out there on the street busting folks for marijuana. And how did you react to that? And how did they react to you? One of the things that we were actually even told was the more affluent areas, uh, white areas, don't go into those areas because those folks know judges, lawyers, politicians. If you go in there, you start locking those folks up, you're going to get feedback. And before you know it, your operation is going to be shut down. So go after the weakest links. And then what happened is that turned out to be in a form of ethnic cleansing. Now, and this is the problem that I got when you're talking about it from a law enforcement perspective because there's nothing that I've heard that, that shows marijuana is so dangerous. Like, matter of fact, alcohol is much more dangerous when you're talking about somebody getting behind the wheel and the things that we know that people can do with alcohol. But yet we had law enforcement people running around, going after people. I mean, getting to the point where, you know, your quota's up, going after people who's got a joint or a seed, you know, small things. Prohibition has failed. Uh, alcohol right. prohibition lasted about 12 years in this country. And it's right. called the Great Failed Social Experiment. 
Well, marijuana prohibition's lasted almost 80 years in this country. Sure. We've arrested 25 million people for it, 90% for possession only, with about a three to one ratio of blacks to whites being arrested right. for it per capita. So um, really what I think needs to be an indicted here is prohibition. Um, whether the drug is legal or illegal is almost a separate discussion. I know it was passed in order to stop a lot of incredible burdens that were being put on folks and stopping people from voting um, in the South or all around the country too. The idea that, that people of color, because that's typically who it was geared towards, um, would have to prove their sort of, sort of their right to vote, um, which was sort of invalidating their citizenship. I think you should be able to register to vote and not show ID at, at, at the polls. Uh, we, we don't want to do anything that's going to make it harder for people to vote. Not enough people vote right now. You know, you're hearing about all of these different issues that people have with something that should be a right in a democracy to just show up and vote. So, yeah. But I live in D.C., so I don't yeah. get to vote often anyways. Since Obama became president, voting rights for many Americans are under attack. About a dozen states are now clamping down on who is allowed to cast a ballot. Opponents argue that these laws are racist and prevent minorities from exercising their right to vote. Now we're talking measures that include showing a photo ID, purging voter rolls, the end to early voting, and for many Latinos, having to show the proper papers. Now, of course, there's always the politics. Democrats argue that this is a shady attempt by the GOP to swing elections. Not so, say Republicans firing back that they're just trying to prevent voter fraud. Well, then in 2013, things really got complicated. That's when the Supreme Court killed a major part of the Voting Rights Act. That ruling and the timing of it, just two years shy of its 50th anniversary, was a huge wake-up call that the fight for voter rights is far from over. When you think about all the blood sacrifice and all of the marchers and all of the fights in Congress, all the litigation that here in 2015, as we sit here, we have states that have passed so many repressive vote, uh, voting registration laws, uh, voter ID laws, uh, come up with you know restrictions on early voting, uh, doing all these things that sound a lot like the old school poll taxes, mm -hmm. sound like when they're talking about citizenship papers, like grandfather clauses. I mean, there's all these uh, restrictions that are happening. As we sit here today, 133 pieces of voter repressive legislation is pending in the states across the United States. It's amazing. Georgia and Indiana in 2005 passed some of the most restrictive voter ID laws in the country. Mm -hmm. You know what? Obama won Indiana the first time a Democrat had won in over 40 years, number one. Then Georgia, voter turnout in Georgia in 2008, after this repressive supposedly ID law, it went off the charts in the black community. Voter turnout was up. So if this is voter suppression, how do you account for blacks for the first time in the history of the country in 2012 outnumber white folks as far as going to the poll. Barbara's Explain got an that answer. Go oh, ahead, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think that's crazy where you flip the people's concerns. Let me tell you, when people went and stood out in those lines for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours in Florida mm -hmm. and hours in North Carolina, I stood out in my line in Maryland for three hours. When people did that, it wasn't because all of a sudden blacks had more power politically than whites. It had to do with the fact that we were so concerned about all these mm -hmm. repressive measures that we said we're going to make sure that we vote, we're going to early vote, we're going to do everything in our power. And because we were vigilant and determined, all of a sudden people are saying, well, that means you're equal. Mm -hmm. No, you just undercut your own argument. If voter turnout is up, it can't be voter suppression by definition. Of course it is. <laughs> Since the Shelby decision in 2013, we have seen a deluge of voter suppression laws in the formerly covered jurisdictions, which are the Deep South, which is a place that has not completely changed. Mm -hmm. We've seen in Texas and North Carolina, in Virginia and Mississippi and Alabama, all kinds of laws that are suppressive because they have a discriminatory impact and effect on voters of color, on African Americans and on Latinos. And so we've seen a, a concerted effort 
to push back against the changing demographics of our country and, uh, and to discriminate in voting against th those very groups, which we've proven again over and over in court. Most of us take it for granted that we have representatives in Congress <laughs> who will fight for our best interests. Well, that's not the case if you live in the District of Columbia. Many have been battling for years to change this. That includes the district's non-voting delegate, Eleanor Holmes Norton. If, in fact, the District of Columbia was a largely Republican city, these members would be on the floor arguing for voting rights for the District of Columbia, uh, just as the radical Republican abolitionists gave us the vote which was then taken from us and well, gave us home rule. I yield. will not yield, sir. The District of Columbia has spent 206 years yielding. The it makes you feel really disenfranchised and like you don't matter just because you chose to live in the capital. It would enable residents of the District of Columbia, particularly those of us in the military, who risk our lives for voting rights and, 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 and enfranchisement. I do believe as a taxpayer of any taxpayer of Washington, D.C., you should not have to forfeit your rights because of your zip code. Kimberly, let's get an update on where things stand. So do you see a parallel between D.C.'s fight for the right, for their voting rights, and what's going on nationally? There's an interesting parallel here, unfortunately. I mean, as all of the celebrations and reflections of the 50th anniversary of uh, not only the March on Washington, but um, uh, the Voting Rights Act, uh, we have to constantly remind people that there are still five million disenfranchised uh, American citizens here in the United States. Many of them live in the U.S. territories, and nearly a million of them live right here in the nation's capital. We have been fighting for t more than 200 years uh, for voting rights, and I want to be clear, we haven't been fighting just for a vote. Mm -hmm. We want full representation, yeah. full democratic equality, and that means proper representation in the House of Representatives, a voting member of the House and two senators. That is what we deserve. That is what the movement and the struggle's been all about. Uh, and it hasn't been more than 200 uh, years of uh, uh, nothing. People have been fighting over time. We won uh, the 23rd Amendment in 1961 to be able to vote for president and for vice president. Uh, lots of lives were lost, blood shed. Mm -hmm. uh, we continued that fight 10 years later to get the Delegate Act. So we do have a delegate uh, to the House, non-voting of course, and then Home Rule came shortly after that. And so now we've just got to finish this fight and make it to the finish line. Oh, absolutely. I'm a first generation, so yes, I've been concerned about it and I've been doing anything I can to keep my brain active. I'm not really concerned that because I don't think it run in my genes because all my relatives, never, nobody from my relatives ever had it. And I pray to the Almighty that I will never get it. You're not affected by things until you're affected. So I'm always, you know, reading blogs about how to prevent this and that. I mean, better to be safe than sorry. I try not to concern myself with getting Alzheimer's, although I've had a grandmother and an uncle, um, her mother-in-law. I've witnessed people um, degenerate from Alzheimer's. It's very, very um, devastating to watch. I uh, would hope that I don't, and I do try to keep my mind busy with, you know, different mental activities because I don't want that to happen to me, but you never know what might happen. Are we any closer to finding a cure? Um, we are certainly making a lot of progress um, in uh, our fight to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. There are currently available treatments, um, and that's why it's important if a person is concerned about their memory to get an evaluation so they can get appropriate treatment. Um, but available treatments are uh, symptomatic. They don't change the underlying disease process. Um, so research right now is focused on uh, trying to alter that disease process, trying to attack the changes that are happening in the brain to uh, slow or halt 
a person's uh, disease progression, the change in their memory over time. And we're also looking at ways to even prevent Alzheimer's disease in people before they develop symptoms. I recently spoke at a conference, a couple hundred people in the room. I asked everybody, have you had an annual physical? They all said yes. I said, did you have a memory screening? Not one person said yes, which is frightening. And a disease which is the sixth leading cause of death in this country and the only one in the top 10 without a cure should be of concern for everybody. What are some of the early signs of Alzheimer's and what's the difference of just normal forgetfulness versus, my goodness, I may have dementia? Anna? So initially the, the changes are very subtle. So it's, it's just maybe needing assistance every now and then. But then when a person consistently begins to forget how to go to places that they've been to hundreds of times, when a person consistently begins to forget how to do activities that used to be automatic, so that causes some concern. So I always tell families, if you're concerned, make sure that you take your loved one for a complete physical because we need to remember that there's a number of other medical conditions that present themselves like dementia that are not. We know there's not a way to prevent it yet, mm -hmm. but is there a way to keep it at bay? Well, we can do things that exercise our brain to try to keep our cognitive elasticity as long as possible. Um, crossword puzzles, um, using your non-dominant hand to brush your teeth could get a bit messy, um, but it's a good way of making your brain work hard um, and not get so caught up in the, the regular um, routine that our brains use, just like exercising. you know, you. know you add weights, you do different types of cross training to try to increase your physical ability. We want to do the same thing with our cognitive ability. And we always encourage individuals at any age to start dancing, start doing ballroom dancing, because you have to think about every step that you take. Interesting. Anything and we else? always tell uh, families that if they have medical conditions, to make sure that they manage those conditions, mm -hmm. because um, folks that have um, cardiovascular disease, for example, have risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and that puts them at a higher risk maybe for developing Alzheimer's. So I always tell folks, if you have a medical condition, um, heart disease, make sure that you manage mm -hmm. them. African Americans in particular have a higher uh, likelihood of having Alzheimer's. Uh, we know it's something has to do with environmental issues. Uh, I've even heard, I've read research studies about lead-based uh, poisoning and how that may well also have some influence on that. We know uh, educational levels have played a role in all of this. So we are very much aware that as persons of color, we have to be really even more on guard and aware that we are more vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease. What precautions should people of color take? Well, you know, I don't think there are precautions in terms of being able to prevent it, but it's, there are precautions in terms of being able to manage it mm -hmm. and to uh, make sure that you do not uh, have it prematurely. Uh, so I think what we need to do is make sure that we're paying attention to things such as cholesterol, uh, knowing that that has also some uh, relationship to Alzheimer's. So the precautions that we need to take care of is knowing that uh, if we have a higher likelihood of having Alzheimer's, that we're financially preparing for it, that we're uh, paying attention to the whole caregiving arena, that we're taking care of our health. Uh, because health is really uh, very important. So not so much the focus on prevention of Alzheimer's, but good health, healthy living, I think is a part of what we need to do more of. People hear Alzheimer's, they hear the word dementia. There's a difference, but are there other forms of dementia? There are yes. many, um, yes. there are actually 70 different types of forms of dementia. So. They're um, not as commonly known, but Alzheimer's is, as you had mentioned earlier, uh, earlier, the more important or the more prevalent type that we see. But there's Parkinson's type, there is vascular dementia, which often mm -hmm. comes um, post-stroke. Um, there can be alcohol-induced dementia, Lewy bodies dementia, and the younger onset, which is a population of folks between 35 and 65 years of age who are um, showing signs of the disease. Like when I look at athletes, mm -hmm. look at football players. We hear after they retire and they mm -hmm. have brain injuries and their whole mm -hmm. life changes. It's not a normal course of life that you play football from the age of five mm -hmm. to the age of 35 where you are constantly hitting your head. 
you know, it, we don't sit in our rooms for 25, 30 years and bang our heads against the wall. It's not a normal course. And then you develop, you develop these strokes and they lead mm -hmm. to Alzheimer's and, and dementia. So there are so many causes that are out there. And I think a lot of people don't know that alcohol also mm -hmm. could be a potential Absolutely. cause of Alzheimer's and dementia as well. So mm -hmm. you talk about living a healthy lifestyle. This is what this is all about, the educational mm -hmm. process of prevention, if we can prevent it. Uh, how much time do you have? I know. I think um, our joke is always it's a full-time job to look for a government job. Yeah. I mean, you fill out the application on USA Jobs and it's basically a black hole. That's what me and my friends kind of tell each other. Todd, let's start with you. Now, I'm sure you've heard that the federal job application process is way too complicated. Is it? So we have to make sure that this is as fair and impartial as is humanly possible. Um, so we're not allowed to make assumptions and when you have those vague resumes it's it's a big assumption so we need a lot more detail in order to be able to uh, take somebody through the process. Have there been some changes that actually make it a bit easier? Let's talk about those KSAs. What does that stand for and how have there been any changes in that area? <clears throat> so we had hiring reform uh, back in 2010 and part of that was the administration was trying to make the hiring process a little bit easier for people uh, able to upload resumes instead of use the builder. Uh, the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, uh, used to be these narratives that you would have to write out in the first part of the application process. I mean, it, it was a very lengthy process. Um, with the changes, we no longer do those in the very beginning if we are going to do them, and it's an option. It's an additional assessment after somebody has been deemed minimally qualified for the position itself. It's really important to understand that a private sector resume or corporate resume and a federal resume are very different. Mm -hmm. um, there's different goals for both. And if you take a private sector resume and apply to a federal government job, it really can um, hinder your job search, mostly because the federal HR people are very interested in the details. Mm -hmm. They want to know exactly what you did, how you did it, the process you engaged in so that they can take you through a process of kind of ranking and rating your application and seeing how that matches up to what they're looking for. We have qualifications that are they're non-negotiable mm -hmm. when it says you have to have these we have to see that you have the actual experience with them um, and if there's five of those we have to see all five mm -hmm. um, so we don't we don't give the human resources people a lot of latitude with that. In general, the federal government wants you to have 12 months worth of experience performing the same type of work that you are targeting mm -hmm. or, or similar in nature, mm -hmm. okay? So if you um, have been an administrative assistant for you know 20 years, you want a job in the government, and you decide you want to be a chef, mm -hmm. that doesn't work unless you have some kind of chef experience under your belt that you can share with the government in your resume. So you really have to, to understand exactly what types of jobs you're targeting, okay? Um, once you understand that, it's important to document um, all of the duties, all of the skills that you have that relate to the job you're targeting. Um, the government really wants to see the relevant experience that you have in your resume. So it's important to really be detailed. My favorite <laughs> example, um, jewelry store manager working mm -hmm. at a local mall, wants a job in the government, we look at her background, um, no jewelry store uh, manager positions in USA Jobs. Surprise, so, surprise. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> so we look at some of the things that she's done as a jewelry store manager. Mm -hmm. So things like managing people, um, dealing with inventory, dealing with contractors and vendors, mm -hmm. looking at financials and budgeting, looking at customer service. Mm -hmm. So these are you know six to eight roles that she's played, and we take that information and build it into a federal resume not a resume that looks like a jewelry store manager and talks right. about cut and clarity and all that stuff. Right. Um, you're really talking about the fundamental skills that she performed as a manager that can help leverage her into the federal government. So In most agencies, um, the HR people will actually do a physical yes. scanning with the eyeballs looking for keywords. Okay. And so it's not necessarily a computer. Yeah, let's There's dispel that myth okay. right okay. off. Yes. All right. <laughs> we'll get to the other yeah. myth, but yeah, that's one <laughs> of them. We can just knock out of the way right now. It's a physical body mm -hmm. looking at your resume, making that determination. Mm -hmm. You have to do everything you can strategically to distinguish yourself from your competition. So that's why you have to talk about your accomplishments, but tell the story behind it. So that screener who may not be a technical expert in your particular field, they read 
read that story and they get the impact of mm -hmm. how well you did the core work that employer is seeking. Now I find the employer really wants to get to know something more about you as mm -hmm. a person. Is mm -hmm. this somebody I want to work with eight hours a day? Is this somebody who's going to be a good asset for, on my team? So as stressful as interviews are for everybody, I always caution my clients, please let some of who you are as a person come through sure. at some point during that interview right. so that that employer gets a sense of, of who you are. Common sense really says, you know, boost yourself up, mm -hmm. make yeah. sure that you're tailoring it, make sure that you really understand what the job is. There are so many people who apply for federal jobs who, again, not only have they not taken the time to tailor the resume, but frankly, they haven't even looked to see whether or not they're really truly right. qualified mm -hmm. for the position. I, I always tell people, wh what is it in life that you can do that you can give the minimum amount of effort <laughs> that gives you the maximum return, because mm -hmm. this isn't it. Mm. <laughs> but that's, that's the point, and Tim just said it, right? I don't think any job that is worth having, right. regardless if it's federal or not, is going to happen for you if you just take the same thing mm -hmm. and throw it against the wall and hope that it sticks. And now, being a veteran and applying, you know, it's just kind of the assumption I think a lot of people have, oh, they just skip to the top of the list. Last year, 67% um, of all new federal hires were non-veterans. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So two-thirds of all new hires in the federal government did not use a veteran's preference of any sort. So mm -hmm. for me, that's the quick answer. I know we talked about, like, there are certain areas that there's a lot of demand, but I want to know, are there areas that you could point people to that maybe there's not as much demand, oh, but wow. the resources, the number of people Good applying, point isn't so much so it, it's a, just a good area to try to go into. Okay, so what are the jobs nobody wants? Come on, tell us. <laughs> so so, so I'm, I, I, I'll take the first crack and I'm, I'm not so sure it's that nobody wants them, but the demand, I mean, if, if you look, we talked a little bit about the, the labor market as a whole in, in industry. Um, I think if you look at that, it, it, it does compare pretty favorably to, to, to government as well. So you're looking at a lot of IT and cyber places. Now, is there a lot of demand by agencies? Absolutely. Is there, are there a lot of applications? Absolutely. But you know what? If you talk to every single agency on, this, uh, on the face of this earth about whether or not they have enough qualified applicants right. in cybersecurity, every one of them will say no. It is not unheard of in a five-day period to get a thousand or two thousand mm -hmm. applications in. Imagine if they decided to keep it open for two weeks, <laughs> right? And we have physical HR people going through each and every one of these. <laughs> And we are required to go through each and every one of these. One of the differences with private sector and public sector, right? We have to. If you apply during that time span, we have to process you through. So you absolutely need to, uh, to apply for it. It just means we're anticipating there's going to be a lot of people applying. That's really why the agency more than likely reduced the number down to, say, five days. Welcome to Match Me If You Can, Dating in the Digital Age. These days, singles aren't just trusting fate to find a soulmate. No, they're also turning to matchmakers and online dating experts to help them find that special someone. There are lots of opinions and advice out there on how best to meet prospects. At a recent dating event held at the museum in Washington, D.C., I talked with several people about this issue, including the head of G's company, Paul C. Brunson. Yeah, so I went on Tinder, um, you know, I heard it was all the rage, I had just broken up with someone, and then my friend was like, oh, you should try online dating, there's, you know, a billion apps to choose. I did Match, and then I did OkCupid. I joined Christian Mingle as a joke, <laughs> but it never really got too far. I've tried a couple of the websites, uh, no luck on those, but, you know, not for me. I'm just playing it cool. I don't, I don't have any goals. Could be a lot of fun, an easy way to meet people and just make new social circles. Well, it's not for the faint of heart, um, and it's not for people who have a fixed idea of what they want to get. You see a person, you see their profile, and then most people do judgments like really fast. And then I find myself kind of getting into this groove where I'm judging people based on pictures flying by. My mother told me on vacation in December how awful she thinks it is, and it's, you know, society's downfall, and I laughed my thought. The thing is, there are so many couples out there, together, married, or dating and happy, who met online. You, it, The proof is there. It's just, I think it might be harder than people expect. Erica, let's start with you. So okay. if you're single, you're dating, uh -huh. you're looking for that special someone, should you be online? Of course you should be online. Everybody's <laughs> online. Why would you want to be left out of the party? Yeah, it's just another way to meet people. Is it the best? Is it the worst? I don't know. But it's just another way to meet people, and you want to maximize your chance. 
to, of meeting someone you connect with. So of course you would want to go online. Now, G, you're a matchmaker and yes. you are with an agency and you incorporate online dating. I think people would be, would be a little bit surprised about that. Mm -hmm. So why are you a big believer in dating online? Because we believe in increasing your numbers, the introductions. So online gives like the best opportunity to reach a broader pool across the country, really around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so ultimately, as matchmakers, we don't just look at it from our sample that we have. We really encourage our clients to also expand their options and increase their opportunities and online dating really gives you that best opportunity. When people come in and to you and to you as well, uh -huh. do, are they a little hesitant at first and oh. a little skeptical? Very much so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially my my older clients who oh, perhaps yeah. were married for 20, 30, 40 uh -huh. years. Online dating didn't exist before, so they really need a lot of extra hand holding. So we kind of talk through that and talk about how it's okay. It's, you know, you're not giving out your number to the whole world, <laughs> it's all right. I know you do the Sexy Singles, which has been hugely popular in Philadelphia. What are the singles saying to you? You know, singles are saying that people don't date anymore. You know, mm -hmm. that the guys will text them and say like, what's up? What's <laughs> <laughs> up? <laughs> Hook up. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, they won't hear from them until a Friday night. Mm. And then they wonder, you know, should I go out with them? He just, he wants to roll by or that kind of thing. So things are a lot more casual than they ever were, especially for the millennials. Mm -hmm. And okay. then the older guys don't really, they, they, sometimes they don't have the energy and they just sort of want to come and sit on your couch. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing an awful lot of. So I, I don't know what people would do if they weren't online dating. <laughs> do you guys agree with that? Well, we actually incorporate traditional standards in our matchmaking. Mm -hmm. We actually have our gentlemen to take lead, decide the date, the location, pay. We mm -hmm. include all of those things. We believe in that, but like you said, Traditional dating has kind of kind of gotten away from people, and so we really try to institute it in our agency. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I always say you get what you allow. So yes. if you allow somebody to keep texting you and ask you out for Saturday on Friday night, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. But if you instead say, you know, you got to book me by Wednesday for the weekend, mm -hmm. that's what you get. So yes. everyone can set their own precedence. Now let's talk about free sites versus the paid sites. Mm -hmm. what, is, what are your beliefs on that? <laughs> I think you should pay at least 15 bucks. <laughs> okay. I'm not for the, the, I get the free sites, um, and I think it's an opportunity, but I'm like, a small financial investment shows, a, to me, a little bit more of a commitment to be a little bit more thorough in your strategy. But I like the free sites as well. Okay. Yeah, I tell my clients, if they are looking for something on the more serious side, their better bet is to pay for an online dating site, like a Match or an eHarmony, because at least you know people have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say you're not gonna find serious people on OkCupid, which is free, exactly. or Tinder, mm -hmm. which is free. I know plenty of relationships that started on those sites, but it's just one threshold you know people have crossed. They put their credit card in. Exactly. And, and, and you know he has a credit card. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Right, right, right. That's one way of betting him, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Let's talk about a strategy. So, you know, maybe you have been on a dating site, have not been successful. Your profiles are not getting the likes, the winks, whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Well, first, first of all, you, you get some honest feedback about your profile picture mm -hmm. because you kind of uh, live and die by profile pictures today. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. often tell a lot of clients, particularly, I know one of the feedback we give often is when you're having to give your picture, make sure you have a full body, uh -huh. not a half a body. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to give, you know, as much information in a very concise way, but keep in mind that people are kind of going through the sites very fast, profiles very fast. A full body picture is definitely a way to uh, get more marketing towards yourself, but a good one. Talk about the profiles. How should they be written? We encourage our clients to be very brief. Wow. Oh nothing lengthy, mm -hmm. don't offer too much, because I believe you can flirt online. Mm -hmm. Give a little chase. Mm -hmm. So if you offer too much about yourself, you could eliminate yourself before you even get the date. It's true. Well, I could talk all day, so how much time do we have? <laughs> um, Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you have to stand out. So there yeah. are so many profiles that just say, I like to laugh and have fun. Mm -hmm. I'm, no, just yeah. I'm just Go as comfortable in a little black dress totally. as I am jeans and a t-shirt, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whatever it is. I'm, I like to go out, I like to stay in with, who cares, right? Mm -hmm. So I say, find the things that make you unique and then write about it. I, I don't care if you do underwater basket weaving, whatever it is, I don't know where I just came up with that, but <laughs> whatever it is, just be honest about it. Be true to yourself because even though you're gonna exclude some people, You'll include the right people. Okay, mm -hmm. so Janice, you must have wrote a, a winning profile. Well, you know, I write for a living, so yeah, that wasn't true. hard. Yeah. But the biggest thing I did was, uh, I'm not a woman who tells her age, because I always believe that a woman who will tell her age will tell everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but this time, I told my real age. <laughs> 
And you know, I and I told my actual height, I'm over six feet tall, I wear heels. If you don't like tall women, do not email me. I will not be mad. Do not tell you, say tall jokes to me. <laughs> I believe you should say what you really want. And that's what I did. And that's how I got what I really wanted, you know? So Cameron, do you remember, I know it's been over 10 years, but do you remember what was the appeal of Janice's profile? Oh, absolutely, I remember her profile. It was very, um, not aggressive is the word, but she put herself out there. She says, I practically live in heels, as she said. And, uh, she does. You know, she made it like, hey, I'm a challenge, come to me. And I was like, all right, I'll take this on. <laughs> when should you take it offline? You know, how many emails, how many phone calls? Oh, Missy, I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> She's the one that doesn't believe in texting or calling first. That's correct. Is, yeah. And well, I know we don't yeah. need to see eye to eye on that. That's okay, because okay. I stand by the advice I give. Wow. I tell my clients to get to the date as quickly as possible, even just after one email back and forth, because mm -hmm. ultimately oh, you really? don't know if you have chemistry oh, you until oh, yeah. you meet in person. So I'm anti the phone call. I'm anti texting before the date, wow. because you can have this false sense of intimacy with mm -hmm. someone or you could judge someone misjudge someone based on his or her texting or phone skills when in reality that person is different in person mm -hmm. folks do, are not a self-aware right and be open-minded what I mean by self-aware is that we have what's, what we call the matchmaking dilemma people come to us and there are a seven but they want a ten if you know what I mean and they're not looking for another seven right so knowing who you are Right, and then being open-minded to know that love could come at an unexpected time or in an unexpected package, that's important. Most people meet their significant other not through a matchmaker, not through an online dating site. They meet them through their social circle. So the best thing that you could do is expand your social circle. Bottom line is that the more people that you meet that share your values, the better likelihood you're going to get lots of opportunity in life. Not just a husband, but more job opportunities, you know, more partnerships. And so think about ways that you can meet new people that share your values. Meetup.com, right? Here, here in DC, we have Side Tour, right? There's lots of small events that are happening that align you with people that share your values that you can participate in, and then you meet more people. You want to get happy with yourself. Right? The people who do the best in dating and do the best then once they get married are the people who truly love their self. Thanks for taking this trip down memory lane with us. Be sure to watch out for our new show starting in March. It's called Artico and will cover the arts and entertainment scene in the DC metropolitan area. From poetry slams to concerts, from fashion to film festivals. We'll go behind the scenes and talk to the people who make art happen. So check your local listings and keep watching WHUT for more information on this exciting new series, Artico. I'm Anquanette Crosby, and until next time, I'll save you a seat. This program was produced by WHUT, Howard University Television, and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.